Okay. Um, first of all, tonight is the vice presidential debate. If you watch the debate tonight and write something up, you can get two points extra credit. Um, because I don't know if there's going to be another presidential debate or not. Nobody knows at this point. Um, and also, given the age of both President Trump and former Vice President Biden, there's going to be a lot of attention paid to the Vice President because they could hypothetically end up taking over for either one of them. Um, so there's going to be a lot more attention being paid to these two VP candidates than in recent years. Also, the midterm exam is now up in Glassboard. It's due a week from today by 11.59 p.m. Um, if we have time at the end of class, I do want to uh, point out a few things about the um, midterm. Okay. Uh, so, we didn't quite finish off. Um, oh, yes, Johnny. You can type it if you can't um, talk and type your question. You might be typing. I'll give it a minute. Okay, so the other announcement while we're waiting to see if you type is that one of the students in this class tested positive for COVID. So you have the option if you want to go online for the next two weeks if you are worried about possible um, testing of COVID. Um, I will leave that up to you. Um, if you would feel more comfortable being online, that's absolutely fine. Um, if you prefer to still come in person, that's fine as well. It's also up to you if you want to get tested or not. Um, unfortunately, the college isn't completely clear on what the policy is other than give the students the option to go online and let them know that someone tested positive. So you can get tested if you want, you can go online if you want, or you can keep showing up. So just kind of an FYI on that. In case you didn't have a question. Okay. So we had ended last time talking about um all right, so we ended here if I remember. Um so we talked about um some of the problems with the legislature, so we'll wrap this up and then we'll move on to the most recent legislative session. Okay. Um, so there is non-legislative lawmaking that's still part of lawmaking. Um, the governor can give recommendations on legislation. Um, he or she can appoint the state board and commission. And he's in charge of the interstate and federal relationship. Um, so it's up to the governor to accept stimulus money or not. So in 2013, Governor Perry, or sorry, no, in 2009, he decided not to accept all of the federal stimulus money that was available. Um, for what reason, I don't really know, but that was the decision that he made. Um, and in 2013, he decided he did not want to expand Medicaid because the state was going to have to pay for the cost initially, and he didn't want to put the money off for that, which actually does kind of make sense. Um, so he's, Governor Abbott is our point of contact. He's the one who's been interacting with the CDC, with the president, um, dealing with the state business, like getting Tesla to come to um, Texas. So the legislature can ask for something, but sometimes the governor can just say no. Um, we also have the role of the state administrators um, interpreting the various statutes put forth by the legislature. Um, if you give, well, let's say you can create new environmental policies, right? You're going to have the Texas Environmental Board, you're going to have the oil companies wanting to get involved. 
how do we interpret this new rule, how do we implement this, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, if Texas violates the state and or federal constitution, then the court will get involved. Um, Last week, Governor Abbott issued an, an executive order saying that there would only be one drop-off location for ballots per county. Um, this is likely been criticized as an attempt at voter suppression. It's definitely going through the court. Um, and in all likelihood, I can't see how the court would uphold this as reasonable. In 2014, federal courts struck down the state's constitutional ban on same-sex marriage. So if we pass a law that violates federal law or the federal constitution, uh, if it doesn't get struck down by the state courts, the federal courts will definitely strike it down. Um, so the legislature can pass laws, but that doesn't mean they're going to necessarily stay in place. And part of the problem with the one drop-off for counties, counties like Harris have something like 4 million people in it. It's not reasonable to have one drop-off way for a county that big. Smaller counties, sure, you could say, all right, if your county has like 2,000 people in it, sure, one polling drop-off place for mail-in ballots, it's not that big a deal, right? But if there's counties, you need at least five per county, I would say. Right. So there's a lot of very valid criticisms of our state legislature. Um, the ridiculously tiny salary doesn't help. Um, the irregular and short sessions mean this isn't a full-time job for the legislators. This is a, oh, right, I have to go to Austin this year kind of thing. And even with the compensation, they're only making about $30,000 from their inception. It's not a lot of money. They usually have to have a roommate to pay for the rent. And of course, you have to find an apartment that's month to month, right? Because you can't have um, a year long lease unless you can afford to have a place in Austin. Um, and Austin is expensive. It's not like most legislators can afford to live there on the salary that they make. But the voters don't want to increase the salary. They look at it and they say, why should we pay you when you're not in Austin? Why should we give you money when you're not there, right? And there's some validity to that argument. But at the same time, it's like $600 a month is ridiculous, guys. I mean, we could be paying them at least 20,000 a year when they're not in session. I mean, make it something, pay them above poverty wages. But the argument is, well, they're not in session, so why should we pay them when they're not working? Um, also, there's not a lot of experience. So 31 senators have to serve on 18 committees, plus work on legislation, plus meet with their constituents, um, so they can't research, they can't craft the bills. So what do they do? They ask the lobbyists to do it for them, right? I don't have time to research this environmental bill. Oh, but someone from um, the oil company is willing to do it for me. Great. Go right ahead. So we see a lot of over-reliance on lobbyists because they don't have the experience they don't have the personal staff, and they don't have the time. So it creates a very vicious cycle of relying on interest groups to tell you how you should vote on the bill rather than your staff helping you to come to a decision by pointing out both sides. Yeah, it's a bit problematic. All right, 
so how could we fix this? Well, first of all, we need an annual session, right? Even if it's only 140 days every year, we should have the legislature in session every year. Um, it would help with the budget. We created a budget in 2019 on the basis that the economy was in an up cycle, we were going to have more money, and then we got hit for pandemic and that budget basically gone, right? So if they've been able to come in session this year, they might have been able to do something about that. We can call, the, the governor could call a special session. Um, why he hasn't, I, I really don't know. I know it costs the state money, but the state legislature should have been meeting in some form or another. Even virtually, there should have been a meeting. And it would help if the legislature could call itself in session. Um, 32 states allow it. I think that members of the legislature probably would have tried to come in to session this year. But having to rely on the governor makes that tricky. Um, so it would be better if they could call themselves in the session and say, this is an emergency and we need to deal with this. Um, we could reduce the size of the House to about 100 members. But again, the state is increasing in size, so reducing isn't necessarily going to help. Um, honestly, we could increase both the House and the Senate. It's probably about 200 in the State House and at least 100 in the State Senate um, to meet everyone's needs. We could also make it one chamber. Um, the only state that has a unicameral legislature is Nebraska, so that's probably not going to happen. Um, but at least increasing the size of both the House and the Senate would be reasonable, I think. Um, we could also increase the salary to about the average of the nine other biggest states, which would give them a salary of about $58,000 a year, which for most people is enough to live on. Um, you could have people who aren't wealthy actually serving in the state legislature. Um, they could work, but then they could also, you know, order to be full-time legislators instead. Um, we could increase the terms for the House and the Senate. Two years just isn't long enough. Um, it's the same problem on the national level. The minute you get elected, you have to start running for re-election. There's no real downtime to work on policy to take a break from campaigning. So maybe make the house four years instead of two. And also maybe give the Senate six years instead of four. Um, give people longer to become experts. Give people the ability to really understand the committee they're working on. Um, be able to become experts in policy rather than um, the building team. Also, it's ridiculous that there's 18 committees in a 31 member Senate. Um, some of those overlap. Uh, there's confusions about jurisdiction. Honestly, you could probably have maybe 10 committees, and that would be more reasonable. Or again, increase the size of the Senate. There's 18 committees and 31 members. That's just not going to work. And also, it would help if we crack down more on lobbying. Um, have personal staff for the state legislators. Take the power of research away from the interest group. Have someone who works only with that representative telling them, here's what the bill actually said. Also, um, lawyers who are also legislators can get essentially a retainer from a corporation that sends lobbyists too often to influence them. And sometimes, if they're lawyers, they can be asked to postpone a trial involving an interest group 
uh, until the legislative session is over. Uh, that's a problem, right? That that should not be allowed to happen. Um, so we need to take money out of it as well. Um, we need to give the legislators a living wage, staff that belongs to each member, or shared maybe between two members, and take the special interest out. Um, because the way the system is right now, it's just not very effective. Any questions online? Uh, no, but um, can you do me a favor? I'm sorry, can you speak up a little bit, please? Uh, I don't have any questions, but uh, can you do me like a favor? Can you hear me okay, or no? I can hear you, yeah. Um, is there like any way you can like adjust your uh like your recording thing? Cause it kind of like sounds muffled. Sure. Is this a little better? Uh it's because like when you talk it sounds like multiple. Yeah, that's because of the math session. Um all right, I'll try to speak up. Uh, I don't mean it. I don't mean to like be mean or nothing. It's just it's kind of hard. Oh, no. It's okay. It's understandable. Um, totally, totally understandable. Can you hear me without the map? Uh, yes, I can hear you now. Cause I think you moved it. It's just because like sometimes like when you're talking, it like it like uh, I don't know like it doesn't sound like. Not that it doesn't sound clear. It just sounds like it's muffled. Like if every something's like around the auto thing. It's the mask, I think. It's because I'm wearing a mask. Okay, um, I'll just. Well, don't don't take um, off. Keep your mask on. <laughs> it's kind of on. Don't worry about it. It'll be fine. All right. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we're going to now switch to the um, last legislative session that we had. Um, which of course was 2019. We're going to talk a bit about um, what was passed in the legislative session. Um, some of the bills, uh, the controversial ones, the not so controversial ones, just kind of the important legislation that got passed. All right, so in terms of education, um, HB1, HB stands for House Bill. So this was the very first bill that was introduced. Um, set the state education budget at $250 billion for two years. Um, coming out of state taxes like property taxes um, and sales tax, local property tax, and the money we get from the federal government. So it's focused on funding public schools, teacher salaries, and early childhood intervention. Um, so the idea is to put funding, of course, into our schools. Um, we still don't put as much money into education as we should, um, but we are seeing some improvements in education funding. HB3 um, gave $11.6 billion um, with $6.5 billion for education spending um, and $5.1 billion basically to lower property taxes and offset the cost of more money going into education. Okay. Um, 
Now, this was both good and bad. Um, it did increase per student funding by about 20%. But, there's always a but, isn't there? They decided to include Billy a bonus of between three to twelve thousand dollars for um, high performing teachers. Now, on the face of it, this doesn't sound super controversial, but what's the problem with this? Where are the highest performing teachers located? The richest school districts, right? Yeah. Think about it. The more resources you have in the classroom, the better off a teacher you're going to be, right? If you can have brand new textbooks, mm -hmm. small class sizes, extracurriculars, you're going to be considered a high performing teacher. Teachers in poor school districts, it's going to be a lot harder because they don't have the resources. So it's a bit controversial because it's like they're rewarding the teachers who live in the wealthier school districts. Also, the idea that you can pay people to perform better gets tricky, right? Or, you know, will someone actually do a better job if you pay them more? Probably, but then they're, I mean, what happens when you stop working? Yeah. Um, but because of the money in HB1 and HB3, these were pretty um, bipartisan, fairly high unity. Because um, obviously it helps that we're putting more money into education, so there wasn't too much of an argument on this. Okay. Other education legislation that came in um, included SB, SB meaning Senate. Um, so Senate Bill 11, um, basically the reason they took this up was because of that shooting in Santa Fe shortly before the school started. Um, obviously that was extremely problematic and also there is unfortunately high instances of school shootings regularly, not this year because of COVID, but usually. Mm -hmm. So what this is designed to do is um, it requires telephones or some kind of electronic communications like um, an intercom or something like that in classrooms so that they can notify teachers there's a shooting, um, public schools, not, oh, not college. Yeah. That would be a good idea for us. Too. It would be a great idea for us too, but um, that's why we are supposed to have that um, rave alert on our phone. So if something happens, they can text us and we can, you know, find out about it. Um, okay. So also, there's supposed to be mental health teams to assess potentially dangerous students. Um, also, give substitute teachers um, the technology to help with the crisis as well. Let them know how to lock the doors. Um, phones, etc. Um, the idea is that we need to fund mental health, campus safety, and resource officer training. Parkland shooting was partly as bad as it was because the school safety officer didn't go in and engage with the shooter like he was supposed to. Um, he stayed outside. And that was a problem. So you need to, that's what they're there for, right? To deal with that situation. He should have gone in there and he didn't and that's a problem. So there's also supposed to be a school safety committee that will meet the semester to discuss plans. So the idea is if a student is showing signs of suicidal or homicidal ideation, we can try to figure something out. Um, Mental health is a huge, huge component of this. Um, part of the problem we see with mass shootings is partly related to mental health. So if we actually do more to help at-risk students, maybe we can minimize the risk of them bringing a gun to school. Um, so again, very, very high bipartisanship on this. People were looking at what happened in Santa Fe and saying, this, this we got to do something about this. Um, and the other important education legislation was 
Senate Bill 12, um, only one no vote in the House and completely unanimous in the Senate. So that should tell you this was also highly, highly supported. Um, basically, it increases the state contribution for teachers' pensions. About $1.1 billion over two years um, to help with the contributions for the next six years. And a supplemental $2,000 um, for retired teachers. Now, some members had wanted an automatic cost of living adjustment for retired teachers. Others said no. So this $2,000 supplemental payment was a compromise. Um, it's helpful in one way, but it doesn't help if you're retired and the cost of living goes up. But at least they're trying to be more to help teachers um, who are part of the state retirement pension. And it does apply to public colleges as well we have the option of doing the state retirement system or taking our chances on the stock market. Yeah, I took the state plan. I was like, I'd rather have a guaranteed amount of money than less the stock market. Mm -hmm. Now we get into the more controversial legislation on abortion and religious freedom. Yeah. House Bill 16, which, to be perfectly blunt in my opinion, is an absolute waste of legislation, basically said, in the extremely rare case that a fetus is born alive after an abortion attempt, the fetus has to be treated and sent to a hospital. If you don't do that, you'll get a $10,000 fine and a class C free felony charge. Here's the thing. That is so exceedingly rare that from 2013 to 2016, this never happened in an abortion case. Most abortions are performed in the first trimester when the fetus isn't anywhere close to fully developed and could not be born alive. Um, it's seen as unnecessary. I mean, the odds that the fetus would survive the abortion attempt are extremely, extremely rare. So it's not necessary in some ways. I mean, this almost never happens. So why are we legislating it, right? It, it's problematic, to say the least. Um, it makes sense in those very, very rare circumstances. But there haven't been any cases where the doctors didn't try to treat the the fetus if it was born alive anyway. I mean, that just doesn't happen. Um, Senate Bill 22, also controversial, um, because it says that state and local governments can't um, give funds or transfer funds to clinics um, that perform abortions like Planned Parenthood. So no state or local funding can go to clinics like Planned Parenthood, even for non-abortion services like STD testing, birth control, mammograms, and pap smears. Obviously, this is being challenged in the courts for a variety of reasons. One, abortion is legal. You're punishing an agency that's not breaking the law, right? Abortion is still legal. Second of all, abortion is a very small percentage of what Planned Parenthood does. Um, they are mostly there for pregnancy testing, STDs, mammograms, pap smears, birth control. Um, so it's an attempt to defund Planned Parenthood, and that is going to make its way through the courts. We have one in Harlingen, but it's not licensed to perform abortions. There's only one clinic in the valley that has a license to perform abortions, and it's in McAllen. Otherwise, you have to get a sign in for now. Um, but federal funding was never allowed to go to abortions anyway, and it just, abortion, women have to pay for abortion themselves. So money wasn't going into abortion services to begin with. Um, again, it's a bit of overkill. And then the other controversial one, Senate Bill 1978, the so-called Religious Freedom Bill. Um, Chick-fil-A is known as being fairly anti-LGBT, 
Uh, they don't believe in same-sex marriage. They don't believe in um, even civil unions necessarily. And for a long time, they were partnering with very extreme organizations like the National Organization for Marriage, which at one point actually advocated killing gay people. Um, so when they asked permission to come into the San Antonio airport, San Antonio said, no, because you're promoting an anti-LGBT message and we don't want that in San Antonio. So what this bill would do is give the state attorney general the right to sue San Antonio for not allowing Chick-fil-A into the airport. The other reason San Antonio said no to Chick-fil-A in the airport is Chick-fil-A is not open on Sundays because they're a Christian organization. When do people travel? On the weekends, right? So the airport would be losing money because Chick-fil-A would not be open on Sundays. So for them, it was mostly an economic issue. You're not open on Sundays. We can't, in good consciousness, allow you to be in our airport. Um, so it's been nicknamed the Save Chick-fil-A Bill. And it, it's fine if people want to go to Chick-fil-A, yeah. But the airport should have the right to say, look, you're not open on Sundays, and we need a vendor that will be open because this is some of the busiest travel days, and we can't afford to lose money on this. But they should also have the right to say, look, in San Antonio, the airport is a representation of the city, and if we're saying we're going to support an organization that says it's not okay to be gay, what kind of message are we sending? So there's, I can see both sides of it, right? Yeah. I can understand both sides of that argument. Okay, so some of the other legislation we've seen, just generally speaking, um, Senate Bill 21 raised the state's legal age to purchase tobacco products, including smokeless tobacco and e-cigarettes, from 18 to 21. This does not apply to military personnel. Um, if you're active military and you're 18, you can still buy cigarettes. Um, everyone else has to be 21 was the idea that obviously we want to cut down on smoking, so if we raise the age, maybe, right, maybe. Um, House Bill 1545 is actually really a good one because um, it gives breweries the right to sell alcohol to go. Um, Basically, the idea is it can increase revenue for breweries and um, support tourism, right? If you go to a brewery and you try something and you can get a six-pack to go, great, right? That's going to be helpful. It also removes the restrictions on how many liquor stores you can own. If you can afford it, you can now own up to 250 liquor stores across the state. Um, there have been no changes to um, when grocery stores can sell beer online on Sundays, which isn't until noon, and no changes in the fact that you can't sell hard alcohol in grocery stores. Um, with COVID, they did change the rules on restaurants to allow them to sell alcohol to go, um, to help with business, right? If you can buy a margarita with your Mexican food, why not? Um, and that may become permanent because it is a moneymaker for the restaurants, and they may say, you know what, you can sell alcohol to go. I mean, they not so, I mean, they can't, obviously, they can't absolutely prevent someone from doing that. But what they'll do is they'll put, like, tape or something over the top of it, or they'll put it in a bag. Um, I mean, they can't stop people from, from opening it, but, I mean, right now with everything, it's just, it's a huge boost for the restaurants if they can at least sell alcohol to go. And most people are going to be smart about not opening it until they get home. Um, not everyone, but at least it's an attempt to, yeah, the majority of people will be smart enough not to be drinking while driving. Um, HB 1631 banned the use of red light traffic cameras that would take a picture if you blow through a red light. Um, seen as unconstitutional. Uh, local law enforcement didn't like this because obviously it's not safe. 
um, people are constantly blowing through the red lights. And the money that came from those traffic fines went to helping trauma centers, so that's a little bit of a problem as well. Um, and again, it's just, if there are red light cameras, people are less likely to blow through the intersection. You remove that, there's no real punishment, right? So why wouldn't you have a traffic camera up so people don't go flying through the intersection? On the plus side, AC 2048 um, basically removes the extra heavy fines for traffic violations. Um, in 2018, 1.4 million Texans got their license suspended because of unpaid fines. Um, because if they didn't pay the fine up front, they would keep getting more money added, more money added, more money added, until they couldn't afford to pay it. So they've removed that. Um, they've removed that yearly fine and basically said, look, you pay it off, you know, as soon as you can, but we're not going to charge you extra for not being able to pay it off right away. So to offset that, um, the state added a $2 a year fee for insurance that they have in Texas and gave the state portion of traffic fines went from 30 to 50. So basically it's designed to help stop punishing poor people who can't afford to pay a ticket of $30 that went up to $1,000. The other really important um, bill was HB 3089, which extended the statute of limitations for sexual abuse cases from 15 to 30 years. Um, if you are someone who's abused by, let's say, a counseling center, but it's been more than 15 years before you found out about other victims, then you were out of luck. Now it gives people the right to go back and sue their abuser later. Um, so it was a unanimous vote in both chambers, right? Let's give people more time to go after organizations. Boy Scouts of America recently agreed to pay people because of sexual abuse, right? So sexual abuse survivors should have more time to go after their abuser and the organization they work for. So now they have more time. And you can mm -hmm. well, and also, if you think about it, if you think you're the only one who's being abused, you may not say anything. Yeah. You're not being right. But then years later you find out, oh, this person was abused, and this person was abused, and this person was abused. Extend the time and give people the right to go after them. So it makes sense. Um, and it's just, it gives people time to process and it gives people time to take action. So this is kind of a no-brainer. I mean, you can, how do you vote no on something like that? It's not going to happen. Okay. So, of course, there's legislation that isn't going to pass. Um, House Joint Resolution 3 um, was a proposal that would have raised the state, sour, uh, sorry, the state sales tax by 1%. Um, a lot of the legislators said that's going to hurt poor people. That's just not something that we can get behind. It's our sales tax is fairly high to begin with anyway because of the lack of state income tax, so they basically killed that. Um, Senate Bill 9 would have increased penalties for fraudulent voting, um, would have made it a felony for ineligible people to vote even if they didn't know they couldn't vote. And the penalties would have been jail time and a fine of up to ten thousand dollars and that got killed thank god because there's already a case where a woman who had a felony for a tax fraud or something um, got out of jail went to vote didn't realize she couldn't talk to a woman and said wait i have a felony can i vote she said no so she didn't vote went home was arrested and now got a five-year jail term for trying to vote you don't need to make it harder. Um, plus, fraudulent voting makes up less than 1% of all ballots cast in any election, so it's not a widespread problem. It's 
if it happens most of the time, it's someone who genuinely doesn't know they can't vote. Right, exactly. You, you can't necessarily know. So luckily that one got killed. Um, Senate Bill 13 um, would have required former members of the state house and the state senate to wait at least two years before becoming a lobbyist. That one didn't get onto the house calendar, but that would have been a big game changer. Um, it would have meant that if someone lost re-election in November, they can turn around and start working for an oil company in December. Um, basically, it would have extended the time where they could turn around and start lobbying their former colleagues. So, unfortunately, that one just didn't didn't get the house on time. Um, and then House Bill 63, which would have um, changed marijuana possession to a Class B misdemeanor um, with a fine of up to $2,000 or jail time or both, um, basically lessening the penalties. Um, but the Lieutenant Governor strongly, strongly opposes legalizing marijuana, so he killed it in the Senate. He was like, no. Um, yeah, he, he's basically like, we're not doing this, and, and killed it in the Senate. And we would have less people in jails if we at least decriminalized it. And Medical, yeah. Like yeah. No, I agree. I think it's ridiculous that they weren't at least considering even just lessening the penalties. I mean, we're not making it legal. We're just making it so people aren't necessarily going to jail the first time they get caught. That's, yeah, anyway. <laughs> All right, so some of the other failed amendments included Senate Bill uh, 1033, which would have um, banned of abortions due to race, gender, or disability. It also would have banned abortion after 20 weeks, even if there was severe irreversible fetal abnormality. So even if the fetus would die um, shortly after birth, um, that one didn't get on the house calendar. And also, how do you prove someone's having an abortion because it's a girl instead of a boy or because um, the child, you, you can't necessarily prove that, right? You can't prove that it's because of gender or race or disability. And part of the thing on disability is that um, there are cases where um, a woman might be told her her fetus is showing signs of possibly being born with Down syndrome, so they do choose to abort. Um, and there's a movement to try and stop that. But then again, the question becomes, how do you know that they're deciding to have an abortion because of that? And also, you know, do you have the right to tell someone that they can't do that? And so they go back and forth. Um, so that one didn't get on. The house calendar and all likely out in all likelihood probably would have been struck down by the courts. Um, House Bill 1139 um, would ban the death penalty for prisoners with an intellectual disability. On the federal level, it's illegal anyway. You can't execute someone with an IQ of less than 70. Um, but it didn't make the deadline for debate. So it's important that on the federal level, it's already in place if you can't execute someone with an IQ of less than 70. Um, there's still questions about mental health. Uh, if someone was uh, schizophrenic or had some kind of mental disorder when they committed the murder, can we execute them? They haven't decided yet. Um, so there's still protections in place anyway, but it probably would have been good to have that on the state level. Um, Senate Bill 1663 would have required a two-thirds majority vote in the state legislature to get rid of Confederate statues. Um, obviously, this is a fairly recent movement with um, people complaining, why do we still have monuments to slaveholders, uh, to people who lost the Civil War? So it missed the deadline for debate. 
Um, so it would have made it harder to remove Confederate statues. That's not going to happen now. Um, and largely it's going to be up to the city to decide if they take them down or not. Um, and how, sorry, yeah, um, how, yeah, HB 2020 um, would have created a pre-trial risk assessment before setting bail. This is important because both Harris and Dallas counties were in violation of federal court orders because they kept setting excessive bail. They would give some more in dollar bail um, or $500,000. So the idea is you need to take into consideration a couple things. Are they a flight risk? Would they potentially harm someone else in the community? And realistically, how much money do they actually have? Um, it missed the deadline for debate, but it's something we're going to have to deal with because you can't basically say, oh, yeah, you can get out of jail, but then tell them you can't actually get out of jail. Okay. So there is a deadline to report a fair person for the disability of the person. For so mm -hmm. is there a deadline to report a deaf person or a disability of a person? No. I'm a little confused. I'm sorry. Okay. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. It, you were talking about the um, HB 139. So mm -hmm. is there a penalty if you don't report somebody dead on time? Is that what it means? N no. For 11, wait, um, yeah, 1139? Mm-hmm. No, basically what that says is... Oh, sorry, um, 939. Um, oh my gosh. Did I go ahead? I think I went ahead. Hold on. The disability one. The penalty for the disability one. If we don't... Um, want to... Oh, no, no. They're talking about you can't have an abortion. They were going to try to ban abortion if the fetus would have a disability. Okay, okay. And I was getting it confused. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Oh, no, that's okay. Although that is a good question. Um, I think usually if someone is missing, um, you have to wait 48 hours to report them missing. And then if you don't report someone missing, then it gets into questions of why didn't you report them missing? And then they're going to look at you a little bit more. Okay. Um, and like there have been cases where people will not report that like their their grandmother or grandfather died so they can keep collecting social security that's okay. Fine. okay so then that's, a, that's something like they penalize uh, it's against the law mm -hmm. okay okay then i was yeah, getting if someone's dead you can get into trouble yeah okay okay i was getting it confused i was listening to it and i'm doing something else sorry no that's okay that's okay okay thank you yeah, and it is interesting because we have a lot of shows about people who go missing, like they'll go to the cops and they're like, oh, you have to wait 48 hours. And then sometimes the cops are like, well, they're an adult, they can they can go missing. And you're like, D -d 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 come on, man. Yeah. All right. Um, and then the last one that came out of the legislative session were the constitutional amendments. Um, Ten were proposed, nine failed to Pass, or sorry, nine did pass, my bad. Um, the only one that didn't was the one that would allow judges to serve more than one municipality. Um, the argument for that was in some areas, there's no need to have two separate judges for small municipalities, but the voters said no to that. Um, they didn't want overlap. Um, some of the important constitutional amendments included Proposition 4, which now says you have to have a two-thirds majority vote in both chambers of the legislature to introduce a state income tax. 
Um, before it was a simple majority. Uh, so basically what this does is it makes it harder for the state to introduce a state income tax. Doesn't make it impossible, just makes it harder. Because um, there's a lot of pushback. People don't want to pay um, a state income tax. So basically they told the voters, if you want to, you can make it harder. And so yeah. Um, Proposition 3 is important because it gives property tax exemptions because of natural disasters, um, floods, hurricanes. Hurricane Hannah did some pretty big damage down here. So you won't have to pay property tax if your house or business is severely damaged because of a natural disaster. And that's really critical. Um, you're going to have to, even with insurance, there's still some expenses you have to pay. So if you don't have to pay property taxes for a year, then use that money to help fix your house. Um, it's pretty much a no-brainer. And in Proposition 10, which got something like 96% of the vote, I know this one's sweet, um, gives retired service animals the ability to be adopted by their former handlers or a qualified caretaker at no cost. Um, previously, what they were doing is sometimes they would put them up for adoption or sometimes they would put them to sleep. Yeah, I know. Um, so basically what this does is if a police officer worked with a dog for six, seven years and the dog's ready to retire, then the dog can go with, with them, right? And that would make sense because they work together. Of course, if you go with someone who used to have a service animal and wants to take one who's retiring. And again, pretty much a no-brainer, right? They should go back to people um, who work with them or people who know how to work with them because they do have that special training um, that would make it harder for, it, yeah, for ordinary people to take care of them as well. Um, so yeah, basically, you know, if you miss the dog, you can go back and, and get them, yeah. It's very sweet. That one I was like, duh, that's a no-brainer. Why would you? Again, I think it got something like 97% of the vote. It wasn't even close. The one that would allow a judge to serve in multiple municipal courts. Oh. Basically, allow um, municipalities to share judges. And I think part of it for the voters was how do we know they'll be impartial if they're tied to more than one court um, or that they'll have time to deal with the demands of multiple courts? So, yeah, that was the only one to fail. The rest of them all went through. Okay. So does our state legislature work the way it's set up? Is this actually a well put together, well run legislature? No? All right, uh, should we have a yearly session instead? Yes. Those of you online, should it be every year as opposed to every other year? About a salary increase. What? Yeah. No one. I mean, seven thousand two hundred dollars is well below the poverty line. I mean, well below it. And I mean, it's. 30,000 would be closer to reasonable, but honestly, it's just closer to 40. We want people to be able to survive. Um, I mean, $600 a month isn't even going to cover your rent in most places. So you, know, you, you can't be a state legislator if you don't have another job or you're independently wealthy and then that $600 a month is like, thanks, but whatever. So. 
You know what I would like to see? I'd like to see more teachers in the state legislature. You want to talk about education? There's a damn well decent educators in the room. Mm -hmm. Oh, so they can manhandle and wrangle, you know, people who are growing temper tantrums, right? Handle their fellow state legislators. Guys, you gotta get back to this. Fair enough. And we need more women, we need more minorities, we need people who are not wealthy. Um, we need more diversity, and that would help. And we need a yearly session, because this year alone proved that, I mean, you can't predict a global pandemic. So making a budget for two years, it's just not, it's not going to work. It's just not going to work. Okay, um, so let me see about um, pulling up the exam. Um, okay. Um, so this is the midterm exam. A um, couple of things to keep in mind as you're working on it. The students do get a little confused. When I'm talking about in question one, how the state government was set up, I'm asking you to describe what kind of government was set up, the legislative body, the governor, etc. Also, and this one trips students up all the time, how do we amend the state constitution? I've gotten multiple students who tell me how we amend the federal constitution. How do we amend the state constitution? Make sure you do not get those two confused. They are different processes. So make sure you tell me how we amend the state constitution, not the federal. Okay, because there is a difference. Um, so I think what happens is students look up how to amend the Constitution and it says federally but not state, right? So make sure you, you put in how we amend the state Constitution. With the second part of the questions, the in your opinion part, there is no right or wrong answer. You will not lose points for your opinion. You will only lose points on this part of the question if you don't answer it or you don't answer it completely. When I'm asking for your opinion, I genuinely want to know what you think. So there is no right or wrong answer. There's no penalty for saying, um, see, we'll just think it works just fine, no big deal, okay? You're only going to lose points if you don't answer that part of the question. So don't be afraid to express your opinion, to share your thoughts. There's no right or wrong answer. It's legitimately, what do you think? Okay. Um, students get a little confused on that sometimes and, and worried, but don't worry about that. Um, it's genuinely just asking, what is your opinion? Okay. Each question is worth 25 points. The exam total is 100. You'll write about a page to a page and a half per question, double spaced, um, preferably Times New Roman 12 point font, but I'm not going to be that picky as long as it's 12 point font. Don't try to do like 16 or 18 point font. Uh, I will know. If you use something other than the book or your notes, um, cite it somewhere in the exam. Let me know it came from a website. If it's a direct quote from the book, cite the page number for me. Um, with the notes, you don't necessarily have to cite those. Um, you can just say from this lecture if you want. Um, but anything that's a direct quote needs to be cited. Um, and anything that you take from an internet source also has to be cited. I need to know where you got your information. 
CT exam will go through um, CFA science, which is a plagiarism check. You'll have two attempts to upload the exam, um, and you will see your score. So if you upload the first exam and you're like, that seems high, let me double check my work, then you can resubmit the exam. Um, basically, I'm just trying to make sure you're not copying and pasting directly from a website and using it in your exam. The other thing to keep in mind with the exam is it is an individual exam. Um, I can't stop you from accidentally bumping into each other at Starbucks and talking about the questions. But if you turn in identical answers or they're close enough that I can tell you wrote the answers together, that's a zero on that question. Um, I've had students in the past who try that, and trust me, I will be able to tell if you do that. So don't do that. Um, I don't have a problem if you want to meet up and go over the questions and say, well, this is what I think it's asking, that's fine. Um, but don't divide up the exam and be like, um, Johnny will answer questions one and two, Crystal three and four, and then we'll swap, right? So, no, it's not a group exam. Um, what else? Um, I think that's about it. It's due in a week by 11.59 p.m. in Blackboard. If for some reason Blackboard's not working, you can email me the exam. Okay, any questions on the exam? Okay, it is, again, it's should I say open book, open note, open internet. Um, just make sure you cite anything that you use. The exam's not designed to make you want to pull your hair out. It's designed to make you think, but it's not designed to make you um, lose your mind. If I wanted to drive you all crazy, I'd make it an in-class exam and want the best score, but I'm not that mean. Yep, it's already on Blackboard. That way you guys have a full week to do it. Are there any questions from the students online? Uh, are those no. the questions that are going to be asked? Yes, they are. yes sure. those are the questions that I've shown you. They are already up in Blackboard. Okay, so we can um, already start doing it, right? <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. Yep, yep. Oh, and also, sorry, I forget to um, mention this every exam. Um, please submit your exam as a Word document or PDF file. Um, I can't open files that are um, got RTF or some of the other funky ones that I get. Um, so PDF or Word doc, preferably. I know some of you might have um, an Apple computer, that's fine. Just make sure it's a file I can open. Um, so I've had students submit exams with a file extension that I can't open. Um, so preferably Word document um, or PDF, please. That way I can open your exam and grade it. And I will give feedback on the exam. You'll be able to see um, where you lost points and et cetera. That way um, you have that for the final. I think that's it for the exam. Okay. Any other questions on the midterm? Okay. So um, we're going to start on the governor next week. Um, for those of you who weren't here when I made the announcement this at the beginning of class, um, one of the students in the Wednesday class did test positive for COVID. So you have the option of going online for the next two weeks if you prefer um, not to risk it because you've been around the student, um, for those of you in the Wednesday class, or you can come to class. Um, it's also up to you if you want to get tested or not. Um, for those of you who are fully online, obviously that's not an issue. Um, those of you who do come to the Wednesday class on a regular basis, you have the choice to go online for two weeks um, to see if you develop symptoms or not, um, or you can continue coming to class in person. That is up to you. Um, it's whatever you feel the most comfortable with. 
Um, inevitably, that was going to happen at some point in the semester. Um, but luckily, uh, because people have been wearing masks and pretty good about distancing in the classrooms, we could be okay. But it is an option if you don't want to come to class, if you're worried about it, you can be online for the next few weeks, no problem. Um, and also, extra credit, tonight's the vice presidential debate. If you write up something about the debate and turn it into me through Blackboard email or regular email, you can get two points extra credit. How long does that have to be? Uh, just like a paragraph or two, just enough for me just to see that you watch all or most of the debate. Um, so then next week we'll start on the governor. We're finally down, done with the legislature, which I think everybody is happy about. Um, so read the first half of chapter seven for Monday. If you have any questions about the midterm between now and next week, you can email me or call or text my cell phone. Um, and I'll see those of you in the Monday cohort on Monday and the rest of you next week.